Hey everyone, welcome back. The SAT and the ACT both love the concept of isolating a variable. This is one of the most popular topics that you'll see on both tests. And it doesn't just apply to algebra. This concept can also come up on a geometry question and even a trigonometry question. So let's talk about different variations of how the tests will ask you to isolate a variable. If you find this video helpful, please hit the like button, share, and subscribe. And be sure to hit the notification bell so that you could see whenever I post a new video. I really appreciate your support. Thank you. Okay, isolating a variable. Here we go. Both tests like to use the language in terms of. Let's see how this looks on an easier question, and then we'll take a look at a harder example. Question 1. What is x in terms of y in the equation x over 5 minus 3 equals y? When they say in terms of, it's just a very complicated way of saying to get that term alone. So when they say what is x in terms of y, it wants you to isolate x. You need to get everything to the other side to get x all by itself. In order to do that, you start as far away from the variable as possible, and then you get closer to it. So in other words, of the 3 and the 5, the first thing we'd want to move is the 3. So using inverse operations, we would add it to the other side. That would give us x over 5 equals y plus 3. And then again, inverse operations. We're dividing by 5 now. So to get rid of it, we'd multiply it to the other side. That would give us x equals 5y plus 15. That's x in terms of y. It means to get x all alone. x is 5y plus 15. So when the test uses the language in terms of, in terms of means to get that variable alone. Let's see how this could now come up on a more difficult question. Question two, what is stuff in terms of meh, crap, and blah? Silly words are fine, the concept will be the same. So when they say what is stuff in terms of ba 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 ba, it's the same as the last one. They want to get stuff all by itself. And just like we did on the last one, you need to think about which terms should we move first. You want to start as far away as possible and then get closer and get closer. So that denominator, crap plus seven, is where we want to start. We want to get that term out of the denominator over to the other side. And we do that by multiplying. That would then give us blah times crap plus 7 equals meh times stuff squared. Now, what would we move next? Remember, start far and get close. So the next thing we would want to move is meh. Right now we're multiplying by that, so we want to divide that to the other side. That would give us blah times crap plus 7 divided by meh equals stuff squared. And now the final step is to get rid of that exponent of 2. Inverse operations means to take the radical of each side. That would make the exponent disappear. So that would give us the square root of blah times crap plus 7 over meh equals stuff. That's the answer. We now have stuff all by itself. Isolating a variable is a crucial skill on both the SAT and ACT. First and foremost, it's the bread and butter of how you solve any equation but it also affects another topic that's very popular on both tests, formula manipulation. Let's see what I mean by formula manipulation. Here's a question that you could very well see on either test. Question three. Errol's average from his first four math tests is 86. What is the minimum grade he needs on his next test to earn an average of 88 from all five tests? So what you want to do is start by writing a formula down. This helps give you a visual of how all the pieces can then plug in. So average equals the sum of the terms over the number of terms. So we could jot in average equals sum over number. And now from there, press pause and see what you can figure out. So before we get to that fifth test, we have to start with that first piece of information they give us. Four tests have an average of 86 we can plug that into the average formula. In other words, 86 equals the sum of the first four tests over four. And now to get that numerator alone, we would multiply that four to the other side. That means 344 equals the sum of the first four tests. And you don't need to know what they are individually. All we have to know is that the first four tests add to 344. And now we could use that on the next step. Now he's gonna take a fifth test and we want him to have an average of 88. So go back to the formula. Average equals sum over the number of terms. Think about how that 344 can now be used in that formula. Press pause, give it a shot. 
So incorporating the second part of the question, we know that five tests are gonna have an average of 88. So plugging all of that into the formula, we could say that 88 equals the sum of the first four tests plus the fifth one over five. And now using this information, we know that 344 represents the sum of those first four. So plugging that in would now give 88 equals 344 plus the fifth test, let's call it Q, over five. And now we could just isolate that Q. But look at what they're doing. They don't want us to solve for the answer to a formula. They want us to solve for a piece inside of the formula. And this is what we mean by formula manipulation. So now, to get the Q by itself, we need to get the five out of there. Multiplying the five to the other side would give us 440 equals 344 plus Q. And then to subtract the 344, 96 equals Q. The answer is 96. So on these types of questions, when a question gives a keyword or formula, write it down. And the reason why, it gives you a visual of how all the pieces can then plug in. Again, they are not asking for the answer to the formula. They told us that the answer was 86 and then 88. That's not what they wanted. They wanted a piece inside of a formula. So by writing the formula down as a first step, it gives you the game plan of how all the data can then plug in. Now, both tests love to incorporate formula manipulation with an average question, but they can test it in other contexts as well. Let's see how the concept of formula manipulation can come up on a slope question. Question four. A line passes through 1, 5, and 3, y, and has a slope of 6. Solve for y. You might have learned that slope is rise over run, or change in y over change in x. So just to be technical about the actual formula, that's m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Press pause. Give it a shot. So using the information that they give us, we know that 6 is the slope. So that's what we could set it equal to. It would be six equals y minus five over three minus one. And before we go any further, notice how this is similar to the average question. They didn't want the answer. They wanted a variable inside. And from there, you can combine the terms in the denominator to give you six equals y minus five over two. To get that two out of there, we'd multiply it to the other side. 12 equals y minus five, so 17 equals y. The answer is 17. So, if you always write the formula down as a first step, it's a great tool to help you visualize where all of the pieces go. Always start by writing the formula down. Let's see how this now works on a harder question. The concept will be the same, even though the formula is a little more difficult. Question five. The distance between three one and eight w is radical 29. What is one possible value of w? I'll give you a hand with the distance formula, just because we need it for this question. So the distance between two points would be all under the square root, x minus x squared plus y minus y squared. Press pause, give it a shot. So using the information they give us, we can plug in radical 29 equals all under the radical, 8 minus 3 squared plus w minus 1 squared. From there, we could get rid of the radical by squaring both sides. That would now give us 29 equals five squared plus w minus one squared. That five squared is 25. So moving that over would now give us four equals w minus one squared. Now you could multiply that out through FOIL or it's easier to just take the square root of both sides. But remember, it would have to equal both two and negative two. So positive and negative two would give us w minus one. And then you could set up two equations to solve for both. w minus 1 is 2, and w minus 1 is negative 2. And solving each would give you 3 and negative 1. The answer is 3 and negative 1. Now this question involved a little more math than the first two, but the principle is exactly the same. They were giving you a formula when they did not want to know the answer. They were telling you the answer. They wanted a piece inside of the formula. By writing it down, you were able to visualize where all of the pieces needed to go. Let's see how this concept can also come up on a trigonometry question. Question six. In the right triangle above, hypotenuse ER has a length of 17. How can you represent the length of ET? In order to get started, we need to know what trigonometry ratio is in play here, so to speak. So let's think about it. We have 25 degrees and X, which is the opposite, 
and 17, which is the hypotenuse. So in terms of SOHCAHTOA, that means we want the sine ratio. Sine deals with opposite and hypotenuse. So if sine equals opposite over hypotenuse, press pause and see what you can do. Once we know that sine is the ratio they want us to use, we can plug in the data that they give us. Sine of 25 equals the opposite x over the hypotenuse 17. And then from there, we get that 17 out of the denominator by multiplying it to the other side. Sine of 25 times 17 equals x. That's the answer. And they don't want a numeric answer. They just want it in terms of the other variables. Again, it's all about isolating a variable. Let's try it on one more harder trigonometry question. Vern hides a jar of pennies in his backyard. He makes a treasure map so he could remember how to find it. Point C represents his front step. Point F represents where the pennies are buried. Point A represents the oak tree. The distance between the pennies and the tree is 12 feet. He correctly measures that angle C is 67 degrees and angle A is 27 degrees. Using the law of sines, how could you represent the distance from the front step to the pennies? Now, I'll give you the law of sines because usually when the ACT wants you to use that, they'll tell you that formula. The law of sines states sine of A over A equals the sine of B over B. What that means is the sine of any angle over its corresponding side equals the sine of any other angle over its corresponding side. Use that data, press pause, and give it a shot. So let's start by labeling the angle measurements that they tell us. C is 67 and A is 27. And now think about what sides are corresponding to those angles. That 12 corresponds to the 67 and the X corresponds to the 27. So using the law of sines, we could say sine of 67 over 12 equals the sine of 27 over X. From there, cross multiply. Sine of 67 times X equals 12 times the sine of 27. And now they just want x. To get it by itself, divide the sine of 67 to the other side. x equals 12 times the sine of 27 divided by the sine of 67. And that's the answer. They don't want a numeric value. They just want it in terms of everything else. So isolating a variable is a key skill on both tests. This can apply to an algebra question, like in terms of or formula manipulation, but it also has applications in geometry and trigonometry. It's all about taking an equation and moving things around. So remember, start far away and work closer. And then from there, it's all about inverse operations. That's how you isolate a variable. I hope you found this video helpful. Remember, always start by writing down the formula. That's what will give you the visual of how to solve for everything. Leave a comment below with any questions that you have. And remember, plan your work, work your plan.